right, um, this video is going to go over how to set up a simple scene in Quilia. So first step would be to look at this main tab, which is the Quilia tab. It's kind of the core components, and they're organized in the order uh, that you kind of need to connect them. Um, the first component that every um, scene needs is this construct particle component. Um, I'm going to set up my, my components, um, and then I'm going to explain what each one of these parameters does. Um, so uh, the next thing is you need a system, and the system takes in our Quilia settings. It also takes in um, emitters. We've taken multiple emitters. We're going to start with just one. Um, so here I've dragged out a point emitter, and I'm going to connect it. So now we have a valid scene. All the scene, all the system needs is really just uh, some Quilia and an emitter. Uh, and the environment is optional. The default is kind of the whole extent of 3D space. Um, all right, so now we have a system and we need to plug that system into our engine, which is going to run um, the simulation. So again, you can have multiple systems. Um, we're going to start with just one. Um, so it takes in our system, and it also takes uh, in this Boolean reset. So when you choose reset, it resets the simulation. Um, and when you set it to false, it runs the simulation. So you can see one, uh, if I plug this in, uh, we now don't have really much of anything because we need to update this scene over time. So that's why we need a timer object. This tells um, the scene to update uh, every, we're going to start with one second. All right, so now we still don't have anything, but we clearly have uh, particles being emitted. So the last thing that we need is a way to kind of expose the fields of a particle, and that's where we're going to use um, the deconstruct particle component. And this exposes all the fields of a particle component of a particle quilia. Um, and so now, so the system outputs our quilia, and we're going to plug it into the particle quilia. Here we can see our scene was updated every one second, and we're able to see them. Um, of course, this is a little slow for most uses. It can be useful if you're trying to analyze your scene. Uh, but I usually set it to 20 milliseconds, um, and this gives you uh, a nice animation. So uh, the, with the point emitter, they're just emitted with um, kind of a random initial velocity that's bounded by these two numbers. So um, if I wanted to, say, only have them kind of travel upwards initially, um, I could drag out an XYZ vector. And if I, so one, if, if it's a zero, zero vector, I plug it into both, that means it has a zero initial velocity and they're not going to move. Um, however, if I plug in something here, you'll see that now they're all given this initial, uh, the initial direction upwards. Um, so if we want them to kind of spout out like a fountain, we might um, have this initial direction upwards, but modulate the x and the y. Uh, so I'll just use this number as well. So here, if I plug in the x and y component here, uh, and the x and y component here, so right now these are still the same vectors, so that's why we're getting this result. Um, but here, I'm going to make this one negative as well as the y to be negative. And now they're kind of spout out uh, upwards, uh, but also to the left and the right. All right, um, the next thing I'm going to add is, but maybe we, we want it to live a little bit longer. So I'll explain the lifespan here. So um, usually, um, if you want your particles to kind of stay on screen longer, you're going to want to set this number higher. A negative lifespan will actually indicate uh, to make them live forever. And it's important to remember that when you change um, these settings, uh, that it's not updated live. So only new particles are going to be emitted with these updated settings. And so you'll see um, that these guys are not dying out. They're going to live on forever. Um, and eventually, they're going to overload your computer. Um, so I'm going to 
make them only live for oops, that's too much. And I'll make them live for uh, oh, that's 150 now. Um, and run this again. So now I'm going to show you um, a simple particle force. Um, so here I'm going to say apply custom force. This allows you to apply whatever force you want. Um, and so the things that it takes in are um, one, it needs a particle quilia. So again, we're going to plug in our particle quilia. And the next thing is it needs a force vector. So let's say I want this to really act like a fountain. So I'm going to choose the unit Z. And I'm actually going to set this to be negative. Now, and you'll see what happens if I just plug this in now. It all immediately just starts rolling downwards by too much. Uh, and that's because this is saying go uh, negative one unit down. So if you're working in inches, it's going to go one inch down every time step, uh, which is probably too much for now, especially considering the initial velocity. So I'm going to set this again something a little bit lower. And maybe even a little bit lower than that. This looks about right. So now they're, they're giving that initial velocity upwards and also being pulled downwards. And we can visualize um, this force because it actually outputs um, the force that it applied to the particle. So here, if I give the particle's position as the anchor, we can see that each particle is being uh, has this uh, kind of downwards force being applied to it every time step. And the other thing you need is that because this position is output as a list, in case you want to have their positions over time, here I'm just going to choose uh, the first item in that list, and that'll make my scene a little bit, a little bit faster. Alright, uh, we can also visualize their current velocities. If we plug in their velocity, here we can see which direction they're headed. So now that we have that, I think I don't need to show their position anymore, and now we just see their velocities. Alright, so now all right, I'll, I'll continue here. So each force has a, a weight multiplier, so this is how much that force is going to be, uh, is going to affect the particle. So uh, a weight multiplier is uh, of one, will affect it uh, uh, just as strong as it originally calculated. Um, but as you drag this downwards, um, it's going to indicate to kind of multiply that resultant force uh, by a smaller number, by this 0.5 number, um, which is going to have it affect the particle less, and of course, if you weigh it by zero, um, they're gonna. It's not gonna. This isn't gonna affect the uh, the particle at all. So here we can see the force is all zeros. I also output this desired velocity, meaning this force's desired velocity is this, but this is a force that was actually applied to the particle. Um, and actually, you can go all the way down to negative one. And you can probably guess what's gonna happen. I set this weight to be negative. You see when it's positive puts this downward force on them, and when it's negative, uh, it's going to apply an upwards force on them. So you see the difference between that and a zero force. Let me kind of go up a little bit faster and you can stay going with this. Alright, so that's the weight multiplier, I'm going to set this back to 1. Uh, this allows you to kind of weight different forces um, by different amounts, so that they affect the particle differently. And lastly, uh, this apply boolean um, is a very useful little thing um, that essentially says uh, it determines whether or not to apply this force. So, uh, a dumb thing to do might be to say don't apply this force, uh, in which case it's not going to apply that force, and it's the same as if you kind of didn't have this force at all, right? There's no difference between not applying and not having it. Um, however, uh, the benefit could be that you might say only apply this downwards force when the particles are within a certain bound. So let's say only apply this downwards force when they are uh, contained in this region of space. 
my x is cubed. So I'm going to say some sort of uh, analysis point in the ref frame. So I do have uh, the ref. And then we have our position, which would be the position. We get a list of Booleans saying whether or not that particle is within this DREF. Essentially, some of them must be within it right there. Um, so what if we were to use this as our Boolean? So now that downwards force is only being applied here. And we can, again, we can visualize that here. So we can see that downwards force is only being applied within this container. Um, hopefully, you kind of see the potentials uh, for something like that. Um, all right, so we've covered forces. I'm just going to go back to applying this. This is a pretty expensive operation, so I'm going to disable it. And we don't need to preview this anymore either. All right. And we're done. All right, so back to let's talk about more emitter things. Um, so continuous flow. Or actually, let's go with creation rate first. So creation rate pretty much says how often do you want. I think my computer is slowing down because of how long this guy's lived for, and there's no reason for me to wait that long. All right. So creation rate is going to determine how often it's going to emit a new particle. So when continuous flow is true, creation rate is going to say, um, you know, emit every frame. However, if I was set this to two, it's going to say emit every other frame. In order for this to be really noticeable, you might drag it up to something like 10 and say emit every 10th frame. Oh, I'm going to bring that just down to 1 and let's continue. So that's creation rate. The next thing that we might control uh, is whether or not to do continuous flow. So uh, right now continuous flow is set to true and that's why they're emitted every frame. If I were to set it false, you see they stop being emitted, right? Because they're just like they're not being emitted at every frame. However, even when I reset my scene, we'll see that we don't get any Clelia, and that's because the number of Clelia parameter um, is pretty important for the continuous flow parameter. So if I set this to false, I need to set how many Clelia to emit at a time. So let's start with one, I guess. So I say emit one Clelia, and I emit one Clelia. If I were to say 10, or I would say 100, boom, then I'm at 100 again. That makes sense. But what about when this is set to true? How does that affect it? We don't want to reset it over here. So if I were to drag this down uh, again to 0, uh, we'll see that it doesn't affect it. It doesn't affect it when it's at 0. But when I set it to, say, 1, it's only going to allow one Clelia to remain in the scene. So let's set this lifespan to be pretty low. Hopefully you can see it. But yeah, so there you go. So even after the particle dies, it's going to emit that another Clelia. So if I set this to three or five, it's going to emit five and wait for them to die to before it emits anymore. And the point is pretty obvious. I'm not going to explain that. All right. So now we have those settings, and I'm just going to disconnect this so that they're emitted every frame um, consistently. Uh, let's look at the particle constructors. Um, the up direction, usually you're going to want to leave that alone. That's just uh, signifying um, the orientation of the particle. Uh, usually you're going to work in real 3D space, but if, let's say, you want it to work inverted or I don't know. You could set a particular up direction. Uh, the next parameter you can play around with for particles is you can give them an initial acceleration. Uh, so here, if I were to give them an initial acceleration in the x direction, they're going to start flying off that way. So we're going to tone it down a little bit, maybe something like this, so that they are uh, accelerating a little bit in that direction. Maybe I'll turn this up to mild. So that's initial acceleration. Uh, we've seen 
full screen now. Can't tell long is still on screen. Right, and the masks. This is how much forces are going to affect them. So here, if I set their mass to something much higher, like 10, we should see a noticeable difference in terms of how much that force is able to affect the particles. You can see there it's affecting a lot slower. If I set the light strain higher, you can see it. But essentially, it's a kind of like a damping mechanism. <coughs> Then we have body size. Uh, this is really go going to come into effect if we have an environment. So let's make an environment. So I'm going to use a box environment. Oh, that's a letter. So we have an axis, axis aligned box environment. Axis aligned just means that you can't have a, a, like a rotated box or anything like that. Uh, then we're going to do a box, and if I make the center box, uh, let's just start with this. So we give it the environment, and it pretty much just restricts their movement to that environment, in this case this box. But they're not really avoiding it in any way. Uh, so let's make them bounce around in there. So here I choose my particle forces, particle behaviors here, bounce contain. Uh, so this takes in again our particle coolio and also an environment. So here's our environment. And now they're bouncing around wildly in that environment. I think I think we need to make this place instead of one, let's set it to five. So now they are bouncing around in that environment. Uh, so now let's say we wanted to represent our particles as spheres. Let's use their position here. And the radius um, is going to be governed by their body size. So here we're going to keep the body size at 1. And for radius we actually need to take the body size and divide it by 2 radius um, and we can see that the particles do indeed bounce off of the sides of the environment and as I change their body size you'll see that it should uh, interact in effect. Remember that when you change these parameters they only get updated for new ones um, so here we can see that their body size is being used to determine uh, you know, the extents and how they should interact with that environment. Uh, so this, this whole sphere thing is taking a long time. So I'm going to go back uh, to not visualizing them as spheres. So now they're bouncing around our scene. Um, but maybe you want to save their positions over time. Draw a line uh, of their trail. So that's what the history link is used for. So here when I plug in uh, my 15, we can see that if we preview this component, you'll see that it is uh, you know, saving every uh, last 15 position. And so what I like to do is use a polyline. You can use uh, an inf polyline um, and use these as the vertices. You can use a, a interpolation line as well, but sometimes it doesn't uh, it doesn't work because of the, the differences between one point to the next. It's just not be used for interpolation, but in this case it works, and we're able to get these trails. I think that covers it. <laughs> we went over a lot, we went over every single parameter uh, of every single component for just a basic scene uh, for particles. Uh, so I'll, I'll be doing more videos like this for, for things like agency and parameters real quick, but there you go. Um, I'll see you in the next one.